All right, I just sent an email off to Dr. Shostak. Hopefully he'll be joining us uh, during the meeting. I think there might have been a little bit of confusion over uh, what day this meeting was, unfortunately. If so, I promise to have him back at a later date. So with that, let's just dive into our other stuff. I'm going to start off with uh, some quick introductions here and uh, go into some club news later. And I think we're just going to shuffle things around. So um, Reverend Pittendre, I think you're going to be up first if you're up for it. Okay, okay, just give me the cue and let me share a screen and whenever you're ready after the introductions. All right, will do. So off we go here. Yeah, so welcome everybody to the Central Florida Astronomical Society's April 2024 meeting. I am Frank Kane, your president. Thanks for coming here, virtually as it is. And if this year, if you're not currently a member of CFAS, what are you waiting for? There's many reasons to join. You'll gain access to our private events and dark sky viewing locations, access to our loaner telescope program, access to our online community through Groups IO. Also, we have quarterly meetings at the Seminole State Planetarium. How cool is that? And as we'll soon talk about, you get free membership into the Astronomical League as well. And we'll be talking more about what that involves. Keep in mind, we are a nonprofit 501c3 organization, 100% volunteer powered. So every penny of your dues goes toward this uh, organization's mission and not anybody's pocket. If you want to join up, head on over to cfast.org to learn more and join online. Today's agenda, our main speaker, hopefully, is Dr. Seth Shostak from the SETI Institute. We also have Reverend Maynard Pittendre with us uh, from the Astronomical League, Executive Secretary, talking to us about the AL. I'll have some club news and we have a very good sized astrophotography showcase. There are lots of awesome uh, eclipse photos from last week, of course, uh, but more than that too. There's a lot of good deep sky stuff there, some rocketry, so stick around for that for sure. Some quick housekeeping. If you have any questions for our guests tonight, please use the Q and A button at the bottom of Zoom there. And uh, special thank you to Jason Higley before I forget. He helped me come up with some of the questions for Dr. Showstack, um, who hopefully will be joining us. <laughs> so with that, we're gonna skip Seth Showstack for now and come back to him. Uh, instead, we're going to jump right to Maynard, Maynard Pittendre. So, Maynard, you are the exec, uh, executive secretary, right, of the AL? Yes, I am. And Excellent. Something I enjoy doing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, so the reason we have you on here is because um, the board's been talking about making AL membership an optional add-on as opposed to something everybody gets by default. And we're just thinking about it. So there will be a quiz on this content, people. Uh, watch for a survey afterwards about what you think about that, you know? So if you think the... Uh, Benefits of the AL are something that you want to keep making a default for the club. Let us know. You know, we're listening. We're we're all ears. But I think you all need to make an informed decision. So, uh, Reverend Pittendre, you have some slides here. Yes, I do. Um, my screen sharing is disabled right now. Uh, let's see. Is it still disabled? Let me uh, push it again and see. Yep. Host is disabled uh, participant screen sharing. Try it now. Okay. Okay, here we go. Excellent. That's, that looks good. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you and to uh, uh, share something of, about the uh, uh, Astronomical League. Uh, the uh, Astronomical League, you probably are aware of this. We're, now, can you see the, the screen, by the way? The uh, we're not getting the presenter. We're getting the presenter view as opposed to the, okay. the full screen. View. All right. What about that? That's better. There we go. Okay. I apologize for that. <laughs> Technology is a wonderful thing when you remember how to use it. <laughs> uh, this is a, a federation of different astronomical societies, amateur and astro uh, professionals are part of the AL. And, uh, one of the things I like to tell people is we're not alone in the universe, uh, primarily because the Astronomical League is connecting astronomers all over the world so we can work together, discovering and sharing the wonder of the universe. Uh, so you're not alone. Now, we've got a long, our purpose is statement that comes straight out of our bylaws, but I'm going to tell you the purpose of the AL is to have fun, to enjoy astronomy, to promote astronomy, and to help each other out, not only within the local club, but uh, across the country to provide resources and to help other people outside of astronomy uh, learn something about our hobby. Uh, we've been around for a while, 75 years uh, and counting now. We've celebrated an anniversary not too long ago. 
And um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're not uh, a new kid on the block. Uh, you'll see that we've got a lot of things uh, going on uh, for the, through the league. We've, we've got around 300 clubs. It's either 299 or 301. I'm not sure where, what it is. But we've got over 23,000 individual members. Now, that's uh, significant because it was only a few years ago that we had about 17,000. And uh, we are growing as an organization, and um, we're expanding our membership into an international community where we've been mostly an American uh, institution for uh, quite a while. Uh, but what I'm here to, to, do, to say today is uh, what can you, uh, what can your astronomical league do for you? Uh, that's what uh, I think you're interested in. And one of the first things that, that comes up a lot of times is the Reflector magazines, top quality magazine. But I want to point out the last two bullet points on that screen. It's member submitted content and it's member driven. Uh, so this is our uh, magazine. And you are invited to write letters to the editor type of uh submissions or full-fledged articles about astronomy history or changes in the uh, field of astronomy, uh, how to do citizen science, um, how to uh, do photography. You can share anything you want. And uh, they work hard to uh, uh, publish uh, the content that members submit. So this is your magazine. And I got to tell you, this is one of the, my favorite things. Uh, in what the Astronomical League can do for you. Observing programs and awards, and there are a lot of them. Uh, I used to fit them on a hat, but the hat became too heavy. Uh, and um, I have gone hog wild with this. Starting in the 1990s, I realized I would go outside and I would just, uh, I, I was looking at the same thing night after night after night, and I hadn't seen anything new in quite a while. And I realized that I wasn't even sure that I'd seen all the Mege objects. So I went to the Mege observing program and decided I was going to tackle that. And uh, so I could say that I'd seen all the objects and it was really a preparation for a Mege marathon where you see all these objects in one night. And I had a great uh, deal of fun with that. And I thought, well, that'll be it. That's the only one I'm ever going to do. But then I got hooked on it. And I did one on comets, and I did one on uh, the Herschel uh, objects, and um, uh, there were all sorts of programs being developed, and I really got hooked on this. And this helped me stay interested in astronomy. I think I was getting a little bored with it. But these programs are designed to improve your existing skills and to introduce you to new skills, uh, to teach you all sorts of new things. Uh, things about astronomy and keep, keep yourself active. And that's what it did for me. It kept me active and growing in the hobby. And uh, you will be challenged and delighted by these programs uh, and frustrated. Some of these things really stretch you. Uh, they have stretched me. and uh, But I have found them just to be of great value. Now, we have over 70 observing programs. No one's really quite sure how many we've got. We got over 70 programs, but some of these programs have a multitude of levels. So we probably have well over a hundred different programs when you think about the different levels each one has. Now, they range from the very beginner scale to the very advanced. Uh, every program will get you a certificate uh, and some of them give you pins. Uh, these are my pins. And believe me, <laughs> this is terribly <laughs> addictive, but it is fun. You start at the beginning and you have programs for the beginner. Uh, designed specifically for people who have just a, a rudimentary knowledge of astronomy. Now, one of the things I like to do when I do an outreach program, especially inside where I'm giving a presentation to people I, and, or in a school, I'll ask how many astronomers are here? And I'll get one or two hands. And then I say, if you ever look up at the sky and say, 
boy, that's a beautiful moon, or wonder where that star is. You are an astronomer. And these programs are designed for the beginners. A couple of them are age specific. If you've got members or uh, children or grandchildren uh, up through 10 years old, there's the Sky Puppy and the Youth Astronomer is for those up through 18 years of age. And, and those programs for the youth give you a sampling across the board of a lot of the other programs. You don't have to have a, a, a lot of heavy duty uh, telescope equipment. There are a number of programs, as you see in the, uh, this list, of all these binocular programs. And I, and I will say that some of the binocular programs are challenging. Advanced double star binocular lives up to its name advanced. But uh, these are are good programs and well worth your time. Some of them are very advanced. Uh, right now I'm working on the target near earth uh, objects. And I really had to, to learn quite a bit before I could begin to make these observations and report them in a submission. Um, through the uh, uh, radio telescope or the radio astronomy program, uh, I've had to build some radio telescopes. I never thought I would do this. Back in the 1960s, when I was a teenager, yes, I am that old. <laughs> the Sky and Telescope had an article about spect uh, spectroscopy. And I thought, that's fascinating. The things you can tell about a star by looking at uh, uh, the spectrum. And I thought, boy, I'd love to do that. Well, it was... Uh, just uh, uh, about three or four years ago that I actually started that program. I'm nowhere near finishing it, but I, I'm just fascinated by this. Some of these programs you can do in less than a year. Some of them will take a few years. Depends on where your pace is. Now, this is a self-serving moment here. This is a commercial break. The Outreach Award. I am not only the executive secretary of the Astronomical League, I am also the coordinator of the Outreach Award. Now, some of you at CFAS have received this Outreach Award. And years ago, before the pandemic, I actually was able to make a couple of presentations in person uh, to some folks who had earned the Outreach Award. This is a great way to give recognition to those volunteers who actually show up and engage in outreach programs. And um, there are three different levels. The first level uh, only takes about five events. And, um, and then there's the stellar level and the master level, which takes quite a while to get to that point. But um, I encourage you that if you're doing outreach, make a submission or the club can make a submission for the members. We also have a master progression program and um, this is for the folks who get addicted and can't get enough of these programs. But these master observing progressions means that you've accomplished both a depth and a breadth of knowledge and skills in astronomy. And there are six different levels to the master observer progression. Uh, I'm uh, up to the gold. I doubt that I will accomplish the platinum uh, level. Uh, it's, it's quite challenging, but uh, well, maybe when I free up some of my time, I'll, I'll tackle that too. There are other master level programs, one's for the binocular and one's for the imager, the photographer, the astrophotographer. Uh, I do a lot of astrophotography. None of them are going to be <laughs> award-winning photographs, but I have fun with it. Uh, but I do have the binocular master, and um, that keeps you on track uh, to continue to challenge you. Now, beyond the uh, observing programs, let me tell you about the citizen science. This is when we really get serious about not just observing and not just introducing uh, programs to people, uh, outreach programs. This is when we're actually doing real science. 
uh, we have programs, the Irving programs, that not only do you make submissions to the Astronomical League, you also have to share your uh, uh, data with different organizations. I did the Variable Star Observing Program, which is the last bullet point on this list, and I was hooked on that. I am now a member of the AABSO. Uh, I've done over a thousand observations of variable stars. I have met people who have done tens of thousands of observations, but it um, uh, there are uh, uh, five different programs that are linked to the AABSO, and you're doing real science. They keep this data and make it available online for scientists to use, uh, scientists who have a degree and are not uh, amateurs. Uh, we also do some work with the ALPO or ALPO, uh, the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. Uh, if you do the Mars, Jupiter, or meteor observing programs, you are also submitting information to ALPO uh, so that it can be available to research. Um, the Occultation Observing Program, uh, I have uh, not done any work at all in that, but uh, it's, it's, it looks interesting. You're observing uh, and timing uh, occultations of asteroids with stars, and, um, it's, um, and you report this not only to the AAL, but the uh, International Occultation Timing Association. So again, this is worthwhile citizen science, but um, uh, I told you a while ago that uh, I'm now working on the target NEO observing <laughs> program. It's connected with NASA. And I, I said that there was a learning curve and there, there was a learning curve. Um, uh, NASA rejected my first three or four, well, maybe five or six <laughs> observations. And so I had, you know, and they worked with me to guide me on, on what I was doing wrong and how I could improve it because they want amateurs to make these observations. They need this data. Uh, we're observing near earth objects and, uh, you, you know, we're, we're trying to save the world from uh, asteroids colliding. A lot of good movies for research if you want to watch those. But the list goes on, and I'm not going to go through the entire list because the list is constantly changing. And there are places you can go to where you can find that people are doing research and they they want uh, amateur astronomers to, to send them data. Uh, for one thing, it's 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 good data that we'll be sending. And for another thing, it's uh, they're getting free assistance uh, from the amateurs. And we love this sort of thing. So... Uh, we are involved as a league of connecting you with opportunities for citizen science. Now, one of the things I really like to do is I like to go to different cities and uh, I, I particularly like uh, going to cities that have a, a baseball uh, team and Alcon or Astrocon is our annual Astronomical League convention. This year, it's going to be in Kansas and yes, it is a baseball city, and I've got uh, tickets already. But more than the baseball, there's the astronomy. And some of these conventions have just outstanding speakers. And I always uh, leave uh, knowing uh, more than I went in. And also, I enjoy meeting people that I may have connected to or connected with online. But now I get to meet them face to face and just sit around and talk astronomy. Uh, this um, uh, next, uh, this year it's going to be in Kansas, but in 2025, join us in Bryce Canyon in Utah. That's a great dark site. I plan to take my telescopes, at least two of them, small telescopes, of course, but there'll be larger telescopes there too. And I don't know about you, but I have found that um, uh, Central Florida, in fact, the entire state of Florida doesn't have enough dark sites. And so this is one of the things we offer. We also offer regional uh, conventions and we promote the local uh, club star parties like uh, the Winter Star Party uh, south of here. Uh, we also have a lot of awards. I'm not going to go through all these things, but um, the Webmaster 
you know, the local club webmaster can be nominated uh, for an award. Uh, it, a woman who's involved in uh, photography, astrophotography, there's a, an imaging award for that, a sketching award that anyone can submit to. And if you've got a, a great newsletter, uh, um, there's an award that you can get nominated for. But we also have youth programs. Some of these involve cash prizes that can be used to, for scholarships. And uh, we're revamping some of these youth awards, but uh, these are very much worthwhile uh, to the young people, um, either in your club or in your community. They don't have to be, many of them, they don't have to be uh, league membership uh, to, uh, to uh, get these uh, awards. But wait, there's more. And I know I'm at the end of 15 minutes, but I'm gonna zap through a, a shotgun blast of stuff. Uh, there's a library telescope. We will help any club uh, begin to get library telescopes into public libraries or school libraries. And um, uh, there's a, there are people who advocate for this, and this is a great thing for the community. We have a, uh, a, a store on our webpage, astroleague.org, and it'll take you to the league sales. You can wear a an astronomical league baseball cap or shirt or, or manuals, observing manuals, a lot of good material. We're on Facebook and we have uh, uh, about once a month or so uh, um, astronomical league live. And so we are doing programs. We have good speakers on streaming. Uh, we advocate for dark skies. I know we're all interested in that. There is a program for the dark sky advocate. I think every club should have at least one person who's gone through this program and knows how to be an effective advocate for dark skies. Uh, and then there's all sorts of guides and activities and, and tools that we're presenting on our webpage and through Facebook uh, and uh so there are lots and lots of opportunities. Uh, you can learn more by going to the web page. If you're like me, you were, you may have been a member through a club uh, with the Astronomical League and kind of didn't pay much attention to it. But when you look at it, there are a lot of things that uh, we offer to you. And um, uh, we are, uh, as uh, Central Florida is, uh, we are a, a not-for-profit organization and um, we are almost an all-volunteer organization. We've got, uh, I think, three people who are part-time workers uh, who work in the store and some other things. But primarily, we're all volunteer. Nobody's paying the executive secretary, I can tell you that. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm happy to be part of the Astronomical League. And you know, I just wonder if there are any questions uh, that anyone would want to ask. Yeah, if you do have questions, folks, hit the uh, Q&A button down there at the bottom. And uh, John Pinto is our Astronomical League coordinator in the club. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you if you just want to say anything, John. But I guess the main question people might have is, how do we get involved in these uh, challenges? You know, um, Do we need to go get a form somewhere? Where do we send it? What's the no. mechanism? Uh, what you want to do is you want to go to the, um, first of all, if you got something specific in mind, uh, you can always email me. And my email is almost on my name. It is maynard at pitchandray.org. No, I'm sorry, dot net, dot net. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, maynard at pitchandray.net. And um, you can find my name, my address, my telephone number. You know, I'm pretty public. And my email address by going to astronomicalleague.org. Uh, I'm one of the contacts there because I'm an officer uh, in the league. And so I'm easy to find. So, on you. the web page, you can go to, on the top menu bar, one of them is observe. And you click that. And then there's an alphabetical listing of all the observing programs. And you pick something you're interested in. And it will give you a good step-by-step um, -step instruction on what to do. Uh, if you're going to do uh, an observing, an outreach uh, uh, award submission, we have an Excel spreadsheet we, we like everybody to fill out. Uh, and you just email it to me since I'm the coordinator of that. Um, 
Some observing programs will require you to do sketches. Some will require photography. Uh, some will just require a, a verbal description of what you see. It just depends on the program. But uh, the information on the forms and all that stuff uh, can uh, are, are available. Now, I'm getting a question from Bill. Uh, can you opt out of getting the hard copy of the reflector? Yes. <laughs> and uh, there are reasons why we want to begin to encourage that more and more. It is uh, two surprises that I've gotten from the uh, being on the AL is how complicated it was for us to revamp our web page. It's a very complicated web page. The other surprise is how expensive it is to have print media. It's getting outrageous. So the more people who opt for the hard copy, the better. And you can do that by, if you want to email me, I'll send it to Mitch Glaze in the national office, and he can walk you through that process. Thank you. Yeah, and there's yeah. a printing increases of what has uh, driven up the price of the AL membership to us. And, you know, we're trying yeah. to find a way to not pass that on to you as members. So, um, but yeah, we haven't had a whole lot of, uh, action within this club with the AL lately. And I think that's just because y'all haven't really known what it offers and what these observing challenges are. And I'm the proud owner of a uh, outreach pin and a webmaster award here myself. So thank you. Outstanding. Outstanding. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, again, watch your uh, emails in the coming weeks. Uh, we are going to be sending a survey around about whether or not you want to uh, take advantage of these programs and uh, how we should handle that with uh, club membership going forward. We're we're going to be part of the AL no matter what. It's just a question of, you know, do we want that to be an optional add-on or something that's you get by default? Uh, we do have one more question that came in from Luke Corwin. Uh, does the AL have a good place to start for someone who has not done an observing challenger program before? These are the very basic ones. Uh, Constellation Hunter, there's one for the Northern Skies and the Southern Skies. So you'd want to start with the Northern Skies, unless you spend a lot of time in South America. Uh, Beyond Polaris is a very basic uh, level for uh, program for any age. And there's something called the Universe Sampler. Uh, that's a good one as well. Now, the other seen here, the Sky Puppets and Youth Astronomer, those are age appropriate. Uh, and so you may have aged out of that area. But uh, I started the, with the Mege. The, if you've done some observing, that's a good basic place to begin. Uh, double stars might be a good place for you to begin. Uh, the best thing to do is just sort of shop through the whole list. But if I was going to recommend sort of a standard place to begin, Beyond Polaris would be a good place to start. All right, thank you. All right, thanks again for giving us that overview of uh, AL benefits. And uh, yeah, if you're not getting the, the Reflector magazine, by the way, let us know. Um, you know, we do have to submit a list of our membership to the AL to uh, synchronize those deliveries. So um, if you're saying, what Reflector magazine, uh, send a note to Alcor, A-L-C-O-R, at CFAST.org, and that should get to uh, John Pinto, who is currently driving, which is why he can't talk to us right now, but that's okay. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, well, I really do appreciate, appreciate being able to be here, Frank. I really do. Uh, uh, always a pleasure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. And yeah, we're still waiting for uh, Dr. Seth Showstack. Um, I sent him an email and a voicemail, so hopefully he'll get that before we wrap up here. Um, the guy is 80 years old, so I hope he's okay. <laughs> he was uh, quite communicative until yesterday, so I'm not sure what happened there. Anyway, if we can straighten it out, um, hopefully he'll be on later tonight. Uh, if not, we'll just reschedule for a future meeting. However, we have lots of more fun stuff ahead for you tonight, regardless. So let me kick it into club news here and our astrophotography showcase. Let me go back to sharing my screen. All right. So some, uh, there we go. Aha, it worked. Yes, so club news. Our next Geneva Dark Sky event is slated for May 3rd or 4th and also on the 10th through 11th. You know, we probably won't do them all. It's going to depend on weather and whatnot. Uh, but depending on weather, uh, one of those dates should hopefully work out. So keep an eye on groups.io for a uh, announcement. Uh, club as we get closer to those dates, usually around the Thursday or so, we make a final call as to whether or not we're going to do it or not. So keep an eye out. We have lots of uh, opportunities coming up for another G Geneva Dark Sky event. Our next uh, club meeting will be on May 8th, just around the corner, Wednesday again. 
Our two guests for that one, we have Charles Bracken, who's an author on astrophotography. He'll be talking to us about deep sky objects and what you're really looking at when you're looking at a DSO. We're also going to have our fellow club member, Jeffrey Martin, presenting a presentation on star party wow moments, giving us an overview of some of the most popular and interesting star parties around the country and his experiences with them. And I know you're all looking forward to our next in-person meeting at the Seminole State Planetarium. That is slated for June 22nd at 6 p.m. And we'll be going back to that same format that we had last time of Choose Your Own Adventure with some programming in the Planetarium Dome, followed by breakout sessions in various rooms surrounding the Planetarium. People seemed to really like that last time. So, um, yeah, we're going to do that. Oh, hey, we had a late-breaking question here from John Pinto. Does it cost anything to do a program? Um, John, are you able to talk or uh, are you still on the phone? I'm not really sure what program you mean. Uh, for the AL? Maybe you can type that in. We'll yeah, it was, yeah, it was a question for Maynard. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he's still here. I'm still here. <laughs> That's a great question. If you're going to do an observing program, it costs you absolutely nothing with the Astronomical League. Now, when I built a, a uh, uh, my first radio telescope, it was an uh, something called an itty bitty telescope, which some of you may be familiar with. And I just walked around for about a year or so until I found a neighbor who had thrown away a, a cable uh, television satellite dish. <laughs> so I took that. But then I had to go to the world's last or one of the world's last radio shacks and get some wires and uh, meters and things like that and, and put it together. I had to buy a soldering gun because I hadn't done anything like that in a long, long time since I was a kid, I think. So there are some things that will cost you a little bit. And um, uh, if you're going to do an H uh, alpha uh, sun uh, observing program, you're going to have to buy that kind of telescope. Uh, which you, you know you you wouldn't buy it if you, you wouldn't do the program if you weren't interested in it. You probably would have that kind of thing already anyway. But uh, the cost is just in the equipment. But it's we try to keep programs away from costing people a lot of money. But you don't pay anything to the AL. You get the free pin, the free certificate. Um, if you lose your pin, we'll replace it for I think uh, five or seven dollars, something minimal. And um, so you, you don't really need to pay anything to us. This is part of your program. And we want, we want lots of people to get just as addicted as I am. <laughs> Excellent. Frank, I'll say also that you mentioned that uh, you, uh, you were thinking of opting out of the universal AL membership and people opting into it. And that is a possibility. We have clubs like that. I don't know how that's done, but... Mitch Glaze at National Office could walk you through that. And I can connect you uh, to Mitch if you need that, Frank. Thank you. Yeah, I think we've got the details on that. But uh, okay, any good. insider track is always welcome. <laughs> okay. it's, it, it's complicated, as you know. So it's a, it's a tough decision, which is why we're looking to our members for some guidance there. Okay. And uh, John also asks, is starting a program just a matter of downloading the PDF? Well, that's that's the place where you want to start. Is is you want to go to the uh, uh, web page, and um, you know I, I don't like to download and print things out. So I just read from the screen, and I, I I make my plan of what I need to do. I'll download the observing form or the reporting form, and then I'll just work on that uh, from night to night. Uh, the target NEO. Um, required some uh, free software that's not available from the AL, but we guide you where that is, Astromerica uh, software. And then uh, all you do is email the coordinators and NASA every time you make an observation of an asteroid. And uh, you hear back pretty quickly whether it's accepted or not, or what the problems are. So th it's pretty simple. You know, we got 70 or 80 different web pages on these uh, programs. And, and I really am serious when I say don't hesitate to email me or contact me or call me. Um, I enjoy, you know, helping people guide through this. I've got 
not all of the programs, but a lot of the programs. And so I've got a good feel of how to do it. So let me know. Thank you. And we heard from Bill Castro, who is one of our, our uh, AL enthusiasts within the club. Uh, he points out that an easy program to start with is the Urban Observing Program. Uh, those are objects that are visible in light polluted skies, which we yes, have plenty of around right. here. That's right. I've, I've left that off. Yeah, that's a good one. Thank you, Bill. All righty. Getting back to it here. Uh, yeah, so uh, keep an eye on your uh, calendar invites from Groups.io for these upcoming events and for more news coming up. But uh, lots of meetings coming up soon. And more club news. There's more. We're also working on an astrophotography workshop by popular demand uh, for using Pix Insight to process your astrophotography data. Specifically, we're starting with LRGB data and uh, Wesley Clem will be hosting that at a date to be determined soon. So stay tuned for details on that. But uh, we've heard you that you want to learn more about astrophotography. So we're here for you. We will help. <laughs> that will be a Zoom based session. So watch for details on that. Also, I want to send out a special thank you and welcome to Sam Selig. He has taken over as membership chair for John Frank. So John Frank can focus on the treasurer role. Uh, so thank you, Sam, for taking on membership. So when you see your uh, membership renewal emails and welcome emails, those will be coming from Sam now instead of John. So thanks for stepping up, Sam. We really appreciate it. And also, I appreciate all of you. Uh, you may remember about a month ago, we put out a call for uh, donations because we were running a little bit tight on our budget because of inflation. And y'all came through. So thank you so much. Um, we actually exceeded our goal for what we wanted to raise for donations this year. And uh, your generosity is, it means a lot to us. It's, uh, you know, we were, it gave us all the feels. But <laughs> thanks to you, the club is in a good shape now. So really, really appreciate all of you who donated. And if anyone else wants to spread the word, uh, there is a handy dandy link on cfast.org just click on support cfast and that will take you to an easy way to send us a few bucks if you can or send it to some friends who might be interested in making some tax deductible donations again we are a 501c3 charitable organization so anything uh, is tax deductible upcoming outreach events this is kind of funny uh, a month ago uh douglas wood said yeah outreach is going to be slowing down now because of daylight savings time but no it has not slowed down uh it's still been super busy coming up uh, for between this and the next meeting there's the girl scout campery in umatilla on the 20th there's an event at red bug elementary at the at 423 and uh this one's worth calling out this one's really interesting uh, we're doing one at for give kids the world yes give kids the world down in Kissimmee on the 27th now that's not actually for the kids it's for the volunteers so but still you know being a part of supporting that organization that's a pretty cool opportunity so if you do want to get involved with that uh, shoot an email to outreach at cfast.org and or join our outreach subgroup on groups.io to be a part of that uh, this is a great way to get started looking further ahead goldsboro elementary magnet school on may 10th and uh after that we'll be past our next meeting so we'll talk about future events at that time and looking back to past outreach, uh, there was a lot going on. We did, uh, in just in the month of March, uh, events at Maitland Public Library, St. Cloud Elementary, Groveland had a star party that we participated in, the Else Youth Camp, Groveland, Stenstrom Elementary. And thank you to everybody who participated in that as well. Uh, that included John Allen, Doug Woods, Len Ward, Sam and Margaret Selig, Nancy Ian, John Frank, Bill Castro, Mark Purnell, and probably some people I don't know about as well. So if I did not say your name, thank you as well. And also there was a lot of impromptu outreach going on during the eclipse. So, you know, if you had a little solar telescope out there or a telescope with a filter on it and showed it to your friends, that counts. You did some outreach. So thank you so much for getting people to look up a little bit and uh, seeing that there's a little bit more to the world there or to the universe as it were. Upcoming astronomical events. Remember, springtime is galaxy season. So if you're looking up in the night sky, all the nebulas are setting pretty early in the night. Uh, but there's lots of cool galaxies to look at if you've got the right gear. Also, some interesting uh, meteor showers and conjunctions coming up as well. April 22nd, the almost full moon will be just a half a degree from Spica. Uh, on April 21st and 22nd, we have the Lyrid meteor shower. Unfortunately, that does coincide with an almost full moon. Uh, so it might be tough to see, but still, it's there. On April 27th, uh, we'll have the moon right next to the star Antares, that red one, uh, in the early morning if you're an early riser. And on May 3rd, that's going to be one you're going to be hearing a lot about. Uh, the moon, Saturn, and Mars will all be in a nice, neat little line. So if you want a nice little, uh, if you like lines, go outside that time. It's, it's always cool to see. 
We also have another meteor shower on May 5th, the Ada Aquarids. That one's a little bit special because it's really more of a Southern Hemisphere thing, but we're close enough to the Southern Hemisphere that we still have a good shot of seeing it. So if you see some meteors that night, you can be all smug about it with your Northern friends. And finally, on May 5th, Mars and the moon will rise together in the night sky, and that should be a pretty cool thing to watch as well. I'm just keeping an eye on my phone here. All right, cool. Moving on. Uh, also, last call on that software BISC Paramount Mighty Mount. Uh, this is your last chance to purchase it outright for the club. Uh, this was bequested to CFAS from our former treasurer, uh, Kent Allingham, who passed away, unfortunately, due to ALS. Um, if you are interested in purchasing this mount, it is an awesome mount. This is the one that I use myself. It's the one that a couple of the award-winning astrophotographers in the club use as well. You do not even need to guide with this thing because its tracking is that good. It's a really good deal. This thing's worth at least 10000 new. Uh, we're hoping to give it to a club member for around 6500 Again, all proceeds will go toward CFAS and our mission. If you are interested, please contact Christopher Hunt at loaners at cfast.org. If you're serious about getting into astrophotography and you have some money sitting around, uh, this is a, a good deal and a good way to get started. Uh, you will not outgrow this mount for sure. Um, if we're unable to sell this directly to a member, we'll probably do something a little bit more creative, like uh, try to raffle it off and make it part of a fundraiser or something. But um, last chance to just uh, grab it for yourself, folks. So please consider that. Also, my usual plea, uh, the CFAS board is always in need of help and assistance. If you want to join any of our committees, uh, please consider it. Give me a, a contact at president at cfast.org if you're interested in any of these roles. Um, I can always use a hand putting these uh, meetings together, for example, if you want to be involved in the programs committee or helping out a membership or the loaner program or helping out with outreach, uh, treasurer, secretary. We actually need a new secretary because uh, of term limits. Uh, Denise cannot run again next year. So um, if you want to be uh, involved with the board in the secretary role, that's probably our most pressing need. Uh, but yeah, we can all use help. So if any of these areas sound appealing to you, please give me a note at president at cfast.org. And with that, let's jump right into our astrophotography showcase. Uh, still no word from Dr. Showstack, which is a little bit concerning. Um, yeah, I left him a voicemail and everything. Anyway, we got plenty of astrophotos to go through. So let's just go there. So up first, uh, the way this always works is if you are present, I will allow you to unmute yourself and talk about your image in your own words. And who do I got first here? Isabel, I think I saw you on here. We've got a couple of cool videos from you. Hello, hello. Hello. Yes. So this, uh, hi everyone. This is uh, actually a cool uh, short video uh, of a flyby well, fly over the eclipse by a satellite. Um, so this was uh, taken around 4 p.m. It was towards the end of the eclipse. And of course, it's hard to see. But I also, I don't know if you put it there, but I also have the same video blown up uh, with a speed reduced to 10%. Um, there we go. There we go. And uh, we try to figure out what satellite it could be. We actually uh, realize it is not the ISS. It is not the Tiangong um, space station. It is not Hubble. But if any one of you wants to try to figure out what it is through the 9K plus satellites that orbit the Earth, mm. I would be grateful. <laughs> well, there's a good chance it's a Starlink. Um, I don't know if that's the right size, but the shape looks about right. But yeah, it's a mystery. What a great catch! But but clearly, it's not a bird because um, the the no. actual speed of it was just uh, really concurring the speed of a satellite. And um, so, yeah, I don't know what Absolutely. that is, but that was pretty cool. All right. Well, maybe next time we can talk about whether it was a UFO. <laughs> <laughs> clearly not, though. Somebody, somebody uh, uh, that I sent it to said, "Well, that's an ant on your scope." <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. Very cool catch, Isabel. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Fritz. Uh, I think Fritz said he was traveling for work. And yeah, I don't uh, see him in the attendees here, but I'll share his eclipse photos for you here on his behalf. Uh, he's not even done processing this one yet, folks, but uh, he also traveled to northern Arkansas for the Great American Eclipse. And this is his uh, stacked photo from, I think it was eight exposures. Oh, I have the details here. Yes. Uh, this was imaged with a Red Cat 51 using an ASI 6200mm camera, eight separate exposures expo uh, combined. And uh, he still needs to finish this with a composite and to add color data. But dang, 
looking pretty good already. That's a great shot of the corona, and you can also see some of those solar flares peeking around the moon there as well. Uh, he also sent us this shot as well, a short exposure image using a Canon 60D and zoom lens. So it's about as simple as it gets. So very cool. Ah, it's still on my bucket list. I didn't get to go see it myself, but uh, someday. And congratulations to everybody who did travel to see the eclipse. Uh, what a show that must have been. And uh, sounds like most people had the clouds apart at least once in a while for it. So yeah, we got lucky. Barbara Harris, I think I saw you. Wow. There we go. Wow. Yeah, I'm yes. here. Um, All right. This is a wide field of, of the North American Nebula and the uh, Gamma Cygni Nebula around uh, Seder. Uh, it's taken with the Canon 50D with a 50 millimeter lens, uh, 120 sub exposures. Uh, for a total of one hour exposure. And I, I, I just love these wide shots where you just dig in and start picking out things that uh, you kind of didn't know existed. Very, very cool shot. And uh, I just love the, uh, the quantity of stars in there and how tight they are. I mean, <laughs> this must be looking like straight into the, uh, the heart of the Milky Way, right? Yeah, Milky Way is right through the middle of those those two mm -hmm. stars. So, yep, amazing stuff. I, I envy your tracking. My gosh, that's really awesome stuff. Yeah, Thank it you, was Barbara. Uh, it was with the uh, the Star Adventurer GTI mount, no auto really? guiding. Oh wow! Yeah, I guess the wide field uh, makes life a little bit easier there, huh? Yeah, the fifty millimeter lens is pretty forgiving. Yeah, very cool. Thank you so much. Bill Castro. Well, we know you're here. Let me unmute you. What do we got here? Okay, yeah. Here's a montage of the eclipse. The details are in the picture. I, I didn't really spend a lot of time taking pictures because I didn't want to miss out on the experience, but I got a few lucky shots there. Uh, we had an eclipse party with about 12 people. And, you know, I almost didn't bring my scope to Ohio. I brought it at the last minute. I'm glad I did. The view of totality with a wide field eyepiece was spectacular. Uh, the, the detail on the corona and the, and the prominence details were excellent through the, through the eyepiece. Uh, it got dark really quick. I couldn't even read my wristwatch. Hmm. I was trying to time it, and that didn't work out. Uh, and we noticed it got about 10 degrees cooler. And we were able to see Venus and Jupiter through some thin clouds, and no problem. Uh, it looks cloudier than it really was. The, uh, that's just what the uh, iPhone did. And it was quiet before totality. And it was very quiet during. Then after totality, I noticed the birds woke up and started chirping away like it was morning. <laughs> you know, it was kind of it was pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, I love hearing about the experience of it because everyone says you can't really describe what it's like to be there. And I've never been there, so all I can do is try to envision it myself. But yeah, it really sounds like something that's uh, that has to be experienced because these pictures are beautiful. But from what I hear, they just don't do it justice. So thank you for sharing. Wes, let me unmute you. Some awesome deep sky work here. Hello, hello. Hello. All right. So uh, here we have M106, uh, one of our neighboring galaxies over there. Uh, I think it's generally in the direction of Ursa Major. Uh, and yeah, I really enjoyed this one, how this one turned out with like the deep stuff in the background. Um, you know, like the, the the primary target, M106, looks really, really nice to me. I like how the color turned out in that and some of the depth and the, the spirals in the center. But uh, one of the things that always gets me about um, uh, uh, broadband targets like this is the stuff you can see in like the lower right. Those like little faint fuzzies there that really start to pop out. Yeah, that galaxy cluster there. I was just looking at my uh, my uh, astronomy software, and I think I think some of those are around four billion light years away, and there's just like a cluster of those there. Um, 
But one of the things that I really like about this image is as I was perusing in my software, the little galaxies in the background, uh, somewhere on the right, and you can't see it just in like this version of the image, there is a little speck that I found that was 12 billion light years away. And um, I don't know if you were, anybody was at the uh, the Robinson Observatory thing with the, uh, the UCF students. I really went to town with my excitement there talking to um, the students about it. So um, it really excites me when those little ones pop out and I zoom in and like, oh, it's there. And um, but yeah, 12 billion light years away, you know, seven some billion years before uh the the solar system even formed you know those photons were released and i caught them and and they showed up in my image here so I, I really love it when that happens absolutely yeah if you just like look at the background of these images it's just full of stuff like there's another one and uh there's another one i mean they're just everywhere so it's oh well, there's another one and yeah there's just so many galaxies out there so many worlds and it makes you think like who might be looking back at us. Unfortunately, they wouldn't be seeing anything because like you said, that's before the earth existed, but <laughs> um, it blows the mind. Awesome stuff. And yeah, I mean, great image, Wes. Um, this is a really tough one to image in my experience. Cause you got those like really wispy outer areas that are kind of hard to get, especially with light pollution. So yeah, well it's done. very, had to be very careful with how I was stretching it to like not mm -hmm. uh, make aberrations and other things show up, but like the part of the galaxy, like the, the fuzzy, edges of it show up properly so it was, it was a bit of a challenged process this one as well absolutely and you'll be teaching us a little bit about that processing soon so uh, i hope so forward to that as well yes thank you so. moving on here we have um andromeda's little uh little cousin here right yeah i um i initially just thought i'd try to get this as like you know a, a start of the night target you know get a couple hours a night on this before like my main stuff came along but then the clouds just didn't cooperate and so i ended up only getting about four hours on this um and so i, I didn't get as much detail in like the edges of m31 as i really wanted but still i, I really like how this one turned out like I, I like the star color and like some of the the detail within within uh m110 there that uh like those little dusty bits that show up around the, the core of it i did like how those turned out so uh, it ended up being pretty good for four hours, but I, maybe next year I'll add more time to it. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, the first time I imaged M110, like I thought those dusty bits were just like a, a smudge on my camera, but no, they're real. So very cool. Thank you, Wes. Yeah, thank you. Oh, who's this guy? Um, yeah, a few of my own that I threw in. So uh, this galaxy is called M66. It's part of what we call the Leo triplet. And uh, I thought this one was pretty cool because uh, you can really see a lot of depth in it, you know, that you don't normally see. So the modern processing tools that we have, like Blur Exterminator, just make images so much more crisp than they used to be able to do. And you see a whole lot more detail that can get pulled out of these things. So even though this is a very, very small galaxy in terms of angular size in the sky, uh, we're seeing a whole lot of stuff going on in there. And those red uh, areas, by the way, are areas of star formation. Those are nebulas in another galaxy. And we pulled that out with some hydrogen alpha data added there as well. Uh, this is well over 20 hours of exposure time. And uh, this actually got uh, a little bit of recognition on Astrobin, which doesn't happen to, for me too often. So I was proud of that one. Uh, this part of this larger image of the Leo triplet cluster, well, not necessarily a cluster, just a grouping of three galaxies that are nearby. So there's M66 in the uh, bottom right there. Above it is M65, which also came out pretty darn good. And over here on the left is NGC 3628, better known as the Hamburger Galaxy for obvious reasons. And you can see there's been some grad, uh, interaction between these galaxies as well. So there's a little bit of warping there on the edges of the Hamburger Galaxy, right? And if you look really closely, I'm not sure this really came out through Zoom, but there is a hint of the tidal tail here. I'm in a meeting. Sort of... oh, sorry. Yes. It's okay. Just listening. <laughs> Isabel, uh, your mic is hot. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, but yeah, there's a, a trail of like stars uh, behind it here that got disrupted by some sort of a passing interaction as well. That's kind of tough to bring out in light polluted skies. So I was very happy to see that. John Starr, are you here? Yes, you are. Look at that. Hey, good evening. Hey. So yeah, so this is, um, I traveled to um, Hot Springs, Arkansas for the eclipse by way of um, Austin, Texas. <laughs> so I um, had to make the command decision to to drive uh, and chase the eclipse. And so um, we arrived uh, 
the morning of. And so um, I didn't have a lot of options for where I was going to shoot, but I found kind of a neat, uh, neat place overlooking sort of this dock uh, here. And so this uh, this image uh, was was taken uh, was taken with a um, 14 millimeter um, Rokinon on a, a Canon EOS R. Um, at uh, this is actually um, as you can tell multiple shots. The primary shot, the eclipse shot, is um, is essentially um, f8 at uh, ISO 100 at four seconds, and then the partial phases there that stack. Um, is essentially at f8 ISO uh, 100 and an eighth of a second and so kind of pleased how how this came out um, in total I took uh, quite a bit of shots um, with this one but this is a, a one one image for the background which came out really well and then and then the stack so uh, ultimately pretty pleased that the clouds parted um, for us and so you can see sort of all those wispy clouds but during the uh, the during totality itself it was it was pretty clear so we uh we got really fortunate. Awesome work. Uh, I think I saw a hand up from Bill Castro. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself, Bill, if you had a question, or that might have just been a glitch here in Zoom. I'm not sure. All right, we'll move on. Yeah, uh, I was uh, I was wondering, is that Venus and Jupiter I'm seeing in there too? That's it. You. That's right. You got it. That's right. So those two little dots there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was obviously much easier to see in person with a 14 millimeters pretty wide, but you got it. Yeah, but that's great that you got it. But yeah, I noticed that too. The dynamic range of my point and shoot camera just didn't didn't do it justice. It was it was you need to see it. Yeah, by for yourself. Completely agree. I completely agree. Awesome stuff. And oh, so this one is from the uh, from the SpaceX launch on Friday. Um, so this is. Uh, I hiked into the Merritt Island Wildlife um, Reserve. I uh, was eaten alive by mosquitoes, so next time I need to plan accordingly. Um, so it was pretty that extra, it, you know, it got post, it got pushed. I guess uh, eighteen minutes or so, and those were the longest eighteen minutes of my life because <laughs> the mosquitoes were just killing me. Um, but this was taken with uh, a Canon EOS R. Um, again, a 14 millimeter broken on at F20 ISO 100 and 180 seconds for the streak shot. And then um, F2.8 ISO 6400 and four seconds for uh, for the background and stars. Gorgeous. Is that the uh, the one where it was the 20th flight of that booster? Uh, That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yep. 1060, I think. Yeah, I saw that come back. It looks pretty good for 20 flights, I got to say. So <laughs> pretty cool. Yeah, I don't know if you caught the one uh, that happened right before this meeting. There was a launch at around 5.30 tonight as well. But um, I guess the feed from that one kind of broke out halfway through. So I hope it made it back okay. We'll, we'll hear more about it soon, I imagine. <laughs> Beautiful shot, though. Thank you. Oh, and we have an animation. Yeah, so this one. Um, uh, let's let it play for a second here. Ooh. So this I took, um, this is a uh, time lapse, obviously. It's uh, 251 uh, total shots. And so I took this on the Canon EOS R um, and a Canon 70 to 200 uh, with a two times teller converter at F8 um, ISO 100 and one, hit, one eight hundredth of a second for the partial phases um, and Bader solar film. And then for the um, totality, it was a whole range. I bracketed the heck out of it. And so I took shots, everything from one four thousandths of a second to, uh, to two seconds. Um, now I will, I will admit, I took a little bit of artistic license in that, um, of the 251 shots, 193 are partial and 58 are total. I took a shot every minute for the partial. So, um, so obviously the, um, the length of time that the total, that totality appears in this video is is extremely exaggerated <laughs> so because i did not take a shot um every minute for 58 minutes for totality which from my location was three and a half minutes so um you can see there's some clouds and stuff sort of passing but again you can see how clear that uh that uh totality was so again got pretty lucky there yep also lucky that we had some nice prominences during the eclipse and those uh pop out really nicely right there god i love that beautiful beautiful stuff Thank you, John. Yep. And we have another John. John uh, Pinto, are you able to speak? Yes, I am. Yes, All I right. am. We have a selection of your C star hits from the past month. Yep. So this was taken uh, from upstate New York on our eclipse trip, where we had some pretty dark skies. 
And one of the reasons I wanted to highlight these is for outreach purposes, the Sea Star really shines because as you could see with just 12 minutes of uh, exposure, you can get, you know, some pretty spectacular results that, you know, hopefully we'll get more of our outreach uh, visitors interested in astronomy. So I just love this one. Yeah, yeah. I love that target too. It's so such a pretty, uh, pretty galaxy. This one's even prettier though. Yes, and that one I've obviously took a little bit more time, but that one actually was from right here in Orlando after I got back just the other night when we had those really nice clear skies. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, always a fun target. Looking good. And this one has a little bit of a story behind it. Yes. So everybody's been talking about uh, T Core Bore, the uh, yeah. Nova that hopefully is going to pop, you know, in the next month or two. Um, and the reason for this particular image is, especially for those people with a C star uh, scope, T Core Bore is not in the Sky Atlas or in a, this, any of the C star sky catalogs. So you can't just type that in and have the C star go to it. However, luckily, there is a, a very tiny little galaxy called IC4587 that is right next to it. So if you just put that into your C star to, to go to it, uh, T core bore is that little star, little orangish, orangey kind of star, just to the upper right of IC4587. So it's an easy way to find it and. Uh, uh, you know, keep an eye out on it each each night. If that is clear, we'll go out there and take a shot, and hopefully you'll catch it when it goes Nova. Cool. Very cool. Thank you, John. There was one other thing I wanted to add, Frank. So uh, sure. I did not submit any of my Eclipse photos because I knew everybody else was going to have fantastic ones. But the one thing I wanted to mention was during the totality, we were in upstate New York, those prominences you could see with the naked eye. You did not need a telescope to see those promises. It was amazing. That's awesome. Hey, uh, Bill Castor has a question, I think. No, I was just going to mention, if you if you see that star brighten up, uh, contact the AAVSO online. They, they, I'm sure they want to know. Absolutely. Yep, much anticipated. So keep an eye on that part of the sky, folks. Leonard Ward. Oh, I do not see you online. However, um, he also sent in a, some solar images. Uh, this is from the 13th. This is a full disk solar image in white light, even though the image is reddish. Um, uh, taken on Saturday, the 13th of April at 11.50 through 11.53 a.m. from his driveway. Um, his filter was an AstroZap glass solar filter and shot with an ASI 224MC camera with a ESAR-102 telescope on a SWEQM35 Pro mount using fire capture. Uh, shutter speed was 0.032 milliseconds, gain of 309, two gigabytes per section, 825 frames. Wow. Oh, and I love the story of how he processed this, by the way. So he started using, you know, tools like PIP and uh, AutoStacker 4 and Topaz Sharpen AI, but in the end, he did a mosaic just using Microsoft ICE and in the at the very end, he ended up using Microsoft Paint to actually stitch those pieces together. So uh, simplicity for the win. I love it. I love it. Also, we have some solar images from Richard Wright. Uh, these are actually left over from last month. But uh, since we didn't do an astrophotography showcase last month, this got bumped into this month. Uh, this is his image of the Copernicus crater on the moon. Some amazing detail there and also some nice little hints of color there. So thank you, Richard. And also a couple of uh, solar images from him as well. Uh, we're going to look at two different ways of looking at the same area here. So this is through a hydrogen alpha filter. And he's got some pretty darn good solar gear, I got to say. Uh, he's got the whole double stack fancy stuff going on that uh, is too rich for my blood. But look at the results. You can just see so much detail about the, uh, the solar surface there and those sunspots as well. In contrast, here's the same area under a white light filter. Um, processed, you know, in a similar manner. So even with just a simple white light filter, you can still see those granules on the surface and some good detail with those sunspots. So thank you, Richard. Great stuff. And even though Derek did not officially submit this photo to us tonight, um, he did share it through CFAS, so I consider it to be fair game. 
uh, check out that image. Wow, that's his image of the total solar eclipse from uh, his spot in Arkansas, I think it was. And the thing that I love about this, I mean, first of all, it's perfect. I mean, look at that thing. But if you look closely, you can actually see the Maria of, of the moon there, right? So uh, there's Earthshine reflecting off the moon. And it's not often that you can really see in one of these images, yeah, that's the moon and not just a black disc covering up the sun. Um, it's just so unsettling to, to see the moon where it shouldn't be like that. So really powerful image. Uh, great work, Derek. And that is all we have for the astrophotography showcase. Let me stop my share. And unfortunately, I have not heard back from Seth Showstack, so uh, I hope he's okay. If I do hear back, we might just schedule a special session to just talk to him for a half an hour, and we'll reschedule this for him at that point. But thank you to everybody who tuned in tonight. Uh, stay tuned for when we can get uh, Dr. Showstack rescheduled. Um, until then, keep looking up, and thanks for dropping in. Bye, guys.